Yeah, I mean, yeah. want the extra minutes, you can take them, right? Otherwise, they cut off pretty quick. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. All right, I'll jump right into this. All right, um, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is James Schinkel. I work with a company called Optical Scientific, and uh, we have a interesting tool that you might be able to utilize for your fence line reporting. It's called LOA. And um, LOA technology was developed by uh, Environmental Research Labs and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the 1970s. Uh, it simultaneously measures the crosswind, average winds across the optical beam, so the crosswinds, bidirectional, and the turbulence, which is over the measurement path, so you can measure like not important to you guys, but we measure the turbulence on wake uh, vortex for jet aircraft. Um, path average wind sensors are going to be a lot more accurate compared to a single point sensor. Um, it offers more spatially representative measurement compared to a single point measurement. So if you're using like one anemometer at one location, we're going to actually give you a path average wind, which we can do up to like 10 miles. And then you can like circle an area and, and do a lot of different things with it. It can get expensive, but there may be applications that you might find it to be interesting, depending on where your uh, facility is. Um, it's a really uh, versatile technology. And it's got a lot of uh, potential for new applications, but again, it's not going to be inexpensive. Um, <clears throat> Hi, how are you? Um, so some of the capabilities of the LOA are you can do micrometeorology, convergence, divergence studies. You can do two-dimensional wind profiles. Uh, you can measure updrafts and downdrafts, plume dispersion. That's what the, the military uses it for plume dispersion and weapons dispersion, uh, laser dispersion modeling. Uh, you do crosswinds, which is really what I think is going to be important here. CN2 strength is more for turbulence, but that's more like for airports. Uh, microburst and, and vertical profile, so you can actually shoot this up, you know, across different areas and measure um, uh, the, the crosswinds and the turbulence that way. So what is optical scintillation, which is what we use? Um, LOA is based on optical scintillation, and optical scintillation is basically light fluctuation and then temporal cross-correlation or time of flight. So that little image over there just shows light being distorted. So when you look at across uh, a larger area, there's different pockets of temperature. Air isn't uniform, right? So you'll have these different pockets of heat that will go across it. You'll see those pockets. And what we do is we have two detectors. They're about six inches on each one, and they're right next to each other. So we shoot this infrared light across, and then we measure 4,000 data points every 0.3 seconds. So we're watching the crosswinds if it's going one way or the other. We can pick those up. Um, so it's, it's measuring very quickly. Um, this is kind of gives you an idea where you have, you know, the flow going across and the turbulence above it, and you have a transmitter shooting across those little bubbles. Uh, I think the marketing guy got a little bit too. It's not really bubbles like that. It's more of the turbulence and the flow like that. But you now they added the bubbles. I don't know why. Um, so when you look at it, the refractive index is the difference that flow creates shadows on our detector. So these shadows are happening when you see these different patterns, they create a shadow, and those create what we call a waveform or like a signature. And it's bi-directional winds are measured determined from the time it takes the signature seen in detector A to go to detector B and the same thing from B to A. So as the flow goes by in one direction, let's say going north, um, you'll pick up those signatures. And then as it's coming back across south, you'll pick up those signatures. So it's just bi-directional. You'll see the transmitter go through here and then we have a preamp behind our uh, detectors. And then as the flow goes by, this is kind of showing effluent, but it's bi-directional. And then right here, you'll see the, the processor, the CM2 processor, and, and, the, and the, the other processor for wind data for crosswinds. Um, so some of the advantage of LOA is it's path average, which is going to be more representative than a single point sensor. It's completely eye safe, so it can operate in public areas. It's portable, so you can set it up on tripods. So if you're trying to get an idea of what's going on somewhere, you can actually throw these up and, and, and use them that way. Um, it can hook up to a laptop. 
we have a long range, so from 200 yards to, to six miles, it's really going to be more beneficial for larger area measurements. Um, sometimes you can just use um, anemometers for maybe a small little area, but if you're looking at a, at a larger facility or something like that, or if you want to measure crosswinds across an area because you're next to another plant and you want to say, hey, although that wind is coming across this area into our plant, um, this might be a good tool to, to consider. Um, it can be powered by AC or DC, so if you have like a car battery, so if you want to set it up quickly, like if you have a plant release and you <clears throat> know that there's a, a certain schools or facility that's, you know, a certain direction you want to set up a bigger path link, you can say, hey, this is going that way, right? Um, they can be placed in areas where uh, it's away from hazards because you can be far away, so that's one way. Um, the installations are going to be site specific. Nobody's going to have the same kind of installation. There's going to be buildings. There's going to be different, you know, topography and stuff. So we can measure the crosswinds up to 10 kilometers. A single LOA will measure bi-directional crosswinds. If you set up two LOAs in an X pattern, it will give you both the X axis and the Y axis so you can measure the magnitude and the wind direction of those vectors. Um, three LOAs or more you can actually do an equilateral triangle where you can surround the area of concern and get the large movement of air of that space and i'll kind of show you how you do that uh, you can use retro reflectors on towers or stacks to measure vertical pro profiles so if you want to put one on the ground and then one up on top of the building you can shoot up and then get the idea of the crosswinds over that larger area um, you can shoot them out windows or over water as well um, so if you're looking at a single path LOA, it measures the crosswind speed along that path relative to the direction of cross flowing across that path. If the path is pointed perfectly north south then you get 10 miles per hour, the wind blowing from the west at 90 degrees to the path, it will be reported as 10 plus 10 miles per hour or minus 10 miles per hour depending on which end the transceiver and which is the, the receiver. So SIN 90, so like some of the guys, I think you would ask this last year, this is why I put that in. Um, if that same wind is blowing from the northwest, it'll be shown as SIN 45 by speed. This is kind of in the math. If you don't understand the math, it'd be kind of boring. Um, when you do two LOAs, what you can do is you can do it in 90 degree. Now that's really difficult to do sometimes with a plant because you can't get to 90 degrees, but we can set them up in, in different ways. So it kind of depends on where you're trying to set it up. We, Kind of review your stuff but if you set them up at a 90 degree angle to the first path first path you can use simple math to calculate not only the speed but also the wind vector based on the ratio of one path to the other so two paths at 90 degrees apart is best and most accurate but you could still do the math with the second path say 20 degrees offset instead of the 90 ideal degrees but the final number wouldn't be quite as accurate uh, for multiple loa data processing we can provide a uh, system to kind of do that. We were before kind of letting everyone else do it, but we have a little mini DCU that we can bring all these in and then just send out that signal to like uh, a system that you have. So we can tie these in. So if you want to bring in a bunch of them, if you use several LOAs, um, what you can do is you can enclose uh, the area and then at each lag, it will measure the crosswind along that optical path. And then by averaging those path vectors on all sides, they'll give you a two dimensional wind over the large area. So you'll kind of understand everything that's going in and out of that area. And by measuring the convergence of divergence of all the wind vectors and all the legs, it'll give you the near ground vertical wind of the enclosed area. So we're going to be below uh, the inversion layer, or below, you know, so we're going to measure kind of at ground or near ground measurements. Um, some of the applications that LOA is used in, because um, you may find other applications where you want to use a, 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 an open path system, maybe not. Um, this is one where we shoot uh, LOA across um, the, the pot rooms of, of aluminum smelters. Basically what happened was is they were using anemometers and the HF was just burning those out every six months. So we put an LOA in there and what happened was is the aluminum industry came to EPA and said, hey, we want to use this technology. So like if you guys want to use any technology, whether it's ours or anyone else's, what you have to do is just go to EPA and say, hey, we want to use this because we think it'll help us. 
and then they'll work with you. But if I go to EPA and say, hey, we want them to use it, they're going to be like, yeah, talk to the, you know, talk to my hand. <laughs> but if you go to EPA, you can really get anything you want. You know, usually you can get an approval or uh, 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 like a alternative technology. So here's some of the, the studies that we have. Uh, this is a one that we did at Table Mountain in Colorado, and it was over a, a couple of miles. And what we did is we set up 10 anemometers, and then we shot the optical beam across that. So we measured the, uh, this is basically just measuring the crosswind and turbulence across that large area. It was really difficult for the anemometers because you can have like a wind gust in one area, so they can, it can kind of get a little confusing, but it just shows that we can match that. Um, this is an optical triangle Met Tower and PAM station study that we did. So basically, if you look at that optical triangle, we had a tower in the middle of that. And then what we did is we had, uh, it was 300 meters and it was surrounded by three LOAs covering a 450 meter equilateral triangle. And then we had these PAM stations, which that 10 PAM were basically weather stations that were around and we they were collecting wind speed, wind direction, pressure, temperature, humidity, and some other parameters. And that's just kind of showing what this study shows. So what we found is the standard scatter diagram shows that the near linear relationship indicated between the solid lines between the two measurements. So if you look at the scatter line, where the, the, the data looks pretty good compared to the other ones. When you start to look at horizontal wind or spatial variations, um, this is where it starts to get really interesting. So the difference between the power, uh, the tower and the optical beams are, are significant when the spatial variation of the wind is really large. So trying to study large bodies of air or wind with a single met tower is really not in your best interest. It would be better to have either multiple met towers or potentially looking at LOA to either surround a facility or look at a facility because it's just when you look at the the tower here let me see if i can get in here when you you can see the spatial variation is a lot different when we're looking over a long area so we're just going to give you a little bit more accurate measurement than just single met towers i've been to some sites where they use a met tower at like 20 miles away but the problem with that is is like you're looking at weather that's 20 miles away and not at your facility so it's really in your best interest to have a good vet station or a good station around your facility rather than counting on something that is further away. Um, so when you're looking at the horizontal wind versus the optical tower um, or the horizontal wind tower versus the optical, um, there were we set them up at different heights. So at 10 meters versus the optical measurements, the horizontal wind, the agreement's good, but it's not perfect. Right. When you go to like some of the higher uh, when you started to get much higher than 10 meters, then it, it kind of started getting a lot. The difference was a lot bigger. So um, this is a, an application that we did at a in California. It was a long time ago, um, but what they did is they had a composting site, and there's some really interesting things that we found here. Um, there was a direct measurement that used these uh, a radiometric method, which is basically just collecting a sample all the time. And they assumed that the wind was always constant, which is not really the best way to do it. Um, and then there was a direct measurement where they used a TDL that was measuring uh, CH4 and NH3. Um, what we learned was is will, winds are seldom constant. So they used the TDL and the OFS, and we did one perpendicular to the arrow, uh, perpendicular and one parallel to indicate when there was a a big change like I was talking about with the, uh, the 290s. And what you noticed is at the start of the test, and I'll show you some numbers here, uh, the wind was blowing north at a steady two feet per second, right? And then after about three hours, the wind died down to zero, and then it stayed calm for an hour, and then towards the end of the measurement period, the wind reversed blowing directions altogether. And one of the advantages of the LOA technology that is that it measures the true crosswind along that optical path. So we're looking along this huge optical path, and therefore the flux through that measurement path is not affected, even though the flux through the other direction might change. So if you're looking at flux going towards a certain area, 
and you're measuring the crosswind, you're going to get a better, you're going to just get better data. Isn't that fairly common though, with, around like in the Texas Gulf Coast, you know, the, the wind is, is on shore during the day, and it's at night, it's kind of the first path as the land now. Right. In, in the open water, it's different temperatures. So right. Kind of, yeah, so you're going to see those changes, but what happens is some people are doing these studies and then they're making assumptions. They're saying, okay, the wind's always going to be constant. It's not. So like, is it to your best advantage to be measuring that wind and then understanding like, is it going out to sea? If it is, I probably shouldn't be getting in trouble, right? And if it isn't, then if it is, then maybe you should. <laughs> you know, it's like kind of a double-edged sword. It's like, do I want to measure it? Do I not want to measure it? It's like, it's tricky. It's always a double-edged sword. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so this one right here, um, when you look at the, the, the ammonia table, there's a low, middle, and a high, and you'll see the numbers. There's a radiometric method, which is the one where they assumed the wind was constant, and then there was the direct measurement, which uses the TDL and then uh, and the, and the LOA. So when compared to the wind data, the source concentrations seem to be much higher with lower wind speeds. <laughs> and the difference in the low-level measurement was the wind was steady. So when the wind is steady, your measurements are low, right? But when the wind dies down, if you have a sensor, and this is really, you know, more beneficial to you, Troy, because you're selling a sensor that's measuring real time. If you have a sensor that's just sitting there collecting all the time, like this radiometric method, what will happen is um, the VOC gases don't disperse because there's no wind. So it's building up. So if you have a sensor that's measuring the stuff and it's building up, is that really an accurate measurement? I don't know, you know, but that's like, to me, it seems like that maybe isn't the best way to do it. And using an open path TDL or, or DOAS or something like that, or FTIR might be in your best interest. And it just shows, you can see the low measurements, like the, I think in the middle, it's like point and the direct, you're at 0 0.03 pounds per hour compared to 0.28 pounds per hour. So it can, you know, and 0.45 pounds per hour at high and low, you know, at the 1.46. So it just shows kind of like these different methods where it's like, okay, that doesn't make sense, right? So it just shows that like if you're looking at, at, at that kind of stuff, you know, getting real time measurements and compared to just having a sample that's just collecting all the time, it may be better to, to look at something that's going to give you a real measurement. And I know I don't sell the, the, the open path gas measurements, but I think those are probably a better way to do that. Um, this is just a LOA that was mounted on a trailer. We did with uh, a study with NASA and Wake Vortex, um, but we found some interesting things here. So what we did is we were looking at turbulence and CN2 data. So we, were, we had two LOAs, or we called them OWBs at the time, and we were shooting up at a tower. So initially the red line was aimed up at, at a retro reflector that was higher, and the blue line was pointed at the lower retro reflector, and then we switched those at a point. But you notice that the indicates that there are, that higher path red measurement, the CN2 is about a factor of four to five lower than the, the lower path blue line. And then when we switched, you'll see it completely switches where it's, it's different. So what we noticed was is the CN2 is affected based on where you're putting these. So if you're putting one sensor up here and one on the ground, we're not going to see the CN2 so much. Now, maybe you're not that interested in the CN2, but we did the same thing for crosswinds. And what we noticed that if you're shooting crosswinds, the agreement of the crosswinds at the higher and lower pass indicates that the crosswind is not as sensitive as CO2. So that means that you can shoot from one building to another or from down here up to high and kind of get a better idea of what those crosswinds are across that area and then get a better feeling. Now, one thing that I thought was really interesting that somebody said to me last year or in a talk I was given is they have an anemometer in one area, but they're bringing in all this air at one place for uh, combustion, right? So all that air is being pulled in and it's actually changing. They're, they think that they're getting all this air in, you know, oh, the wind's coming into our plant or going out of our plant, but it's because it's going into this, uh, you know this process so the question is is like how do you place these anemometers in such a way that you're not getting punished for something that maybe isn't your necessarily your fault right um so 
LOA technology measures the, the true crosswind average across the path. So the flux through that measurement path is not affected, even though the flux through the other direction might change. Um, we can accurately measure the space average two dimensional wind velocities over that large area. Uh, these uh, spaced average two dimensional wind measurements are more representative than uh, average wind than maybe a few instruments can be. So if you're looking at one or two instruments, you're not going to really be that that accurate. And we could probably give you a, a, a better feel for that. Um, especially if you're looking at a, a, a med station that's you know at an airport far away. It's better to measure it at your site. Um, if you do the X pattern, we can measure the magnitude of the wind direction and the wind vectors. Um, the spaced average horizontal wind velocities can be obtained from the wind measurements of three sides of a triangle. So if you want to surround your facility, we can do that with a number of LOAs. Or if you want to surround a process, um, you kind of want to make it a larger area. Sometimes you can get by with just using regular anemometers. If you have like a couple of them, you know, or three or four or five or six or seven, but then it starts to get expensive. So it's like, do you want to just maybe surround it, an area and then kind of get a better feel for that? Um, if you combine LOA with other sensors like, uh, uh, you know, like Spectrum's uh, open path system, I think you'd get a lot more accurate measurements of what's actually happening at your facility. Because if you think about it, if you, if you do a test and you have a radiometric method, if you have a, a sample that's just collecting and sitting there for two weeks and there's no wind and it's piling up, is it really that much, you know, if you're worried about your fence line, is it really that much going across? Whereas if you have a regular measurement, it's going to give you a more accurate thing saying, hey, this is what's actually going across there. So um, these are the people that use us. Um, we're mostly used by the military and, and NASA and research facilities for LOA. So they use it for weapons dispersion modeling and, and stuff like that. So, you know, it's an expensive, it's not cheap to put these things up. I mean, they're about 30 grand a pop. And if you're looking at four or five of them, you know, it can quickly get expensive. So I'm not going to lie about that. But if you're trying to understand what's happening at your facility, you know, we can definitely work with you and EPA and, and, and any other company to kind of help you get a better feel for what's actually happening with the wind. So if you're working, the wind's going to really affect everything that happens around your facility. So if we surround that facility, um, we'll give you a better feel for that. Remember, it's not expensive for the government, though. <laughs> Price. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. <laughs> but, you know, the, the question is, is like, do you, like, what, what, you know, if you put, like, so if you're, I was at a site one time in Pocatello, Idaho, and it was JR Semplot and FMC. And JR Semplot was like this beautifully clean site. They met all the compliance. And then FMC was on Indian tribal lands, and they did nothing. So it was like going into Gotham City. So you get out there and it was like, there was so much phosphorus coming out of that place. It was crazy. But the problem is, is you're right next to that site. So if you put up a line of an LOA and you say, this is what the true crosswind is across that area, then maybe you can say, hey, that pollution that we're reading <coughs> is coming from that site. So if you have a line right here and your measurement path is here and the wind is coming from another plant, is are you getting in trouble because the wind is coming, you know, it's blowing the pollution from that other site into yours. So could you use LOA for something like that? Where you're like, hey, I just want to know the crosswind across this area. Or, you know, if you're on like a coastal site and there's a bunch of schools and stuff where you're like, hey, I want to know if it's blowing out to sea or I want to know if it's blowing towards this community. We could tell you that, you know, and set it up in a way like that. So, you know, again, it's, it's not inexpensive and but it is very accurate and can give you good data. So does anyone have any questions or you guys just want to give him a purchase order? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So for yeah. your, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did, um, with your cup top end, are you in the lower 